said, flowing through its servers and, and routers and stored in near bottomless databases will be all forms of communication, including the complete contents of private emails, cell phone calls, Google searches, as well as all sorts of personal data trails. And this is targeting not just people that are considered, you know, enemies of the state or potential terrorists, you know, but pretty much anyone, they will, all, almost all communications really that aren't encrypted, and maybe some that are encrypted too. So, besides the real-time monitoring, there it's a huge database store center too, and so it's going to be able to hold trillions of gigabytes of electronic communications. And so, while they're doing real-time monitoring of communications, you know, in the present, they're also storing all that information. So, you know, in the future, when say they are able to crack the latest encryption algorithms, they can go back to encryption data, encrypted data that they stored previously from years back unencrypted and sort of read all those communications as well, so. And I mean, this happens on a local level as well. You've probably heard of a couple years ago about the Maryland State Police um, infiltrating and monitoring activist groups in Baltimore, um, like uh, peace groups, anti-death penalty groups. Like, they even, like, sat in on some uh, Red Emma's meetings, too. And it's totally ridiculous, but that's sort of, um, it happens on a local level as well. So. And there's, there's so much more about state surveillance I can go into, but for time I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, for folks that just came in, that uh, the website address that I put at the board there um, is a list of resources I compiled, um, sort of a, a lot of links about state surveillance you can read up on, as well as all the tools I'm going to cover today. Um, you can, there's a lot of resources about that, you can look it up uh, after the workshop. So, the technologies that that we can use to combat surveillance. Um, there are more chairs. I'm sorry. There's I'm, one here. I don't know if uh, someone's sitting in the room. There. There's, there's one there. there. Oh, and there's one here. Sorry, there are more chairs. Um, but they're basically, I'm going to categorize these technologies in three categories. Um, the first one is privacy and so, privacy in my definition is about ensuring your communications can't be read by anyone other than the intended uh, like recipients of the communication. And so basically privacy is all about um, encryption, or at least in the way I'm going to talk about it. Um, there's also secure, or anonymity, um, which is basically hiding or obfuscating the origin and or destination of your communications. So even if the communications can be monitored, no one will know who sent them or who is receiving them. And finally, uh, security. Uh, which is ensuring the integrity of your communication devices, so like cell phones, computers, or Facebook account, whatever, and as well as data storage, like on your computer, your hard drive. Um, so this is sort of about securing your environment. So privacy, like I said, I'm going to be focusing on encryption as a method for privacy. There are two main, main types of, uh, of encryption. There are other types as well, but these are the main types. One is shared key. Encryption, so um, if both parties communicating use one, like say a passphrase or something to encrypt their messages, um, they both use, use that same passphrase as something agreed upon ahead of time. Um, and then there's public key encryption, um, which is they don't use a shared um, key for encrypting. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a second. And there are combinations as well that use, use both of those and different sorts of types of encryption. So shared key um, encryption, the first one that I mentioned, um, you can see at the bottom, they use a, the same shared secret in order to take input, like a, a message. They use that key to encrypt it into a ciphertext, which makes it unreadable to anyone monitoring the communications. It is then sent to the, to the recipient, who then uses that same shared key to decrypt it into the original text. So that's the most basic form of of encryption. This, this is used for Wi-Fi. If uh, any of you have Wi-Fi networks at home, you probably use shared key encryption, a passphrase that you type in in order to get onto the wireless network. Um, the second type is public key encryption. And so this one is a little more complicated. I'm going to try and explain it best I can. But if anyone has questions about anything, just totally raise your hand and I'll try and answer them. Um, so for public key encryption, basically, um, you use your like, computer or something to generate a pair of keys. Each person generates a pair of keys. So using a lot of random numbers and other lots of mathematical stuff that's way beyond me. I don't understand it. Basically, a key generation program will, will give you two keys. One is public and one is private. And these, it's these keys that you will use that are yours, your own, personally, that you will use to, um, 
encrypt communications. So the way that it works is that we have these two people here, Roy and Rick. Um, if Roy wants to send a message to Rick, um, Roy uses Rick's public key and takes the, you know, I'm going to go up to the board, it's kind of easier. Roy takes the data that he wants to send to Rick. Um, so it could be a message, it could be a file or whatever. And takes Rick's public key. And then the encryption program that they use does a lot of crazy math and turns it into an encrypted message or data. Then the data is sent over to Rick. And then Rick uses his private key. The private key is mathematically related to the public key. And so any data that's encrypted with a person's public key can then be decrypted using the private key. So the public key is, using for, is used for encrypting messages. The private key is used, used for decrypting them. So when Rick receives the, the data that was encrypted with his public key, he can then use his private key, which he doesn't share with anyone else, to then decrypt it and get the original message or data. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the shared that? key, like both people could decrypt it with what, that one key? Exactly. Okay. And that's something I agreed upon ahead of time, so that you both have a shared key before you communicate or send files or whatever. So, any other questions on this? It's really kind of complicated and mm -hmm. took me a while to understand it. Um, wait, yeah. when it says uh, Rick's public key, Roy is easy. So right. is it some form of data or code? It is, um, it's a, it's a, I'm pretty sure it's a really large prime number, is essentially what it is. But when you when you generate private and public keys, you obviously keep your private key private so no one else has it. But your public key, you distribute to anyone you want to communicate with. Oh. And so when they have your public key, they can use that to then send you an encrypted message. Um, so in this setup, each person has to memorize two numbers. One will be memorize your public number you give to everybody, and the private one I would memorize. Well, you wouldn't actually memorize it because it's super, super long. So you would store it on your computer in a file, basically. Um, and there's some there's some uh, public key encryption programs that I included on my list of resources. And it'll there's some guides that'll show you how to generate the keys, how to store them, and how to use them for encrypting messages. Um, and so a couple of technologies that use public key encryption are HTTPS. Has anyone heard of that? No. So basically, when you log on to say your bank's website, it's a way to you know, communicate with that website without having your information unencrypted so that anyone could look at it and steal your bank records or whatever. So um, when you're when you're browsing the web, you'll see in the address bar at the top left, there'll be, depending on what browser you use, some indication that you're using HTTPS, and that means your communications are encrypted. Um, PGP is another one. PGP is most often used for um, for email encryption. It can also be used for files, but generally this is how you would go about uh, encrypting email and sending encrypted emails to other people. Um, and again, there's uh, there's uh, some guides in the in the resource manual about how to to uh, about PGP mail encryption and how to use it. Any questions so far? Yeah. Um, do you, you, do you make something HTTP or PGP, or do you have to use the server? Um, some websites you? provide both HTTPS as well as just plain HTTP, which means it's unencrypted. Um, if you want to make sure that it's, if, if they offer it, you can, when you type in the address, you can type HTTPS colon slash slash whatever, like, um, Show you an example. Like, if I wanted to go to this web address, and I think they offer HTTPS. You could, you could just type that. A lot of websites you won't see the S, which means it's unencrypted. So, a lot of a lot of websites like banks and like I think Facebook offers it by default now. If you're gonna type in a username and password, it should be over HTTPS, or else someone it's it has the potential for someone else to to capture and monitor your login credentials and other information you send. For Gmail and Twitter, that there are options that you can select that requires them to use HTTPS. That's true, yeah. All and the time Facebook and, too, I think. And you should go and click yeah. those. Yeah, definitely check your, your settings for Facebook, Twitter, Gmail, any kind of account that you use online and see if they offer a, uh, an option to do HTTPS by default. The ones you just mentioned offer that.
There uh, is also an add-on on Firefox mm -hmm. called HTTPS Everywhere. Which yes, will that's a good one. Automatically uh, go to the HTTPS version of the website. Yes, that's a great add-on. I highly recommend it. It's put out by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, and it's also listed in here too. If you want to look up later. So if you use Firefox, and I highly recommend you do, look for uh, this plugin. It'll make it HTTPS by default for every website that offers it. Um, so what are some, some strengths of encryption based on what I just talked about? How would that help you in keeping your communications private? You need the key to actually reconfigure the message. Mm -hmm. So basically, you couldn't read it if you didn't have the correct key. Mm -hmm. Anything else? It allows only people that are intending to get that information to get it, whether it's somebody that's legitimately getting it or someone that's spying, but they at least are intending to get it, as opposed to like a, an auto robot that's fishing for data. Yeah, so anyone who has the key could read it. Sometimes people you don't want to have the key might have it, so. But, yeah, that's, that's the basic gist of it. So, um, what would be some vulnerabilities? How could, how could someone still get, get to your communications, even if they're encrypted? Hacking. Like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, if you, were, if you were a hacker and you wanted to find somebody's, if you wanted to read someone's communications and it was encrypted, what would you go for? Basically, um, based on what we talked about with the ship keys and all that. <coughs> well, you'd probably get the key, right? Try and get the key? Well, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So if we go back to our public key encryption, if I stole Rick's private key, would I be able to read communicate encrypted communications sent to him? No. Oh. No, you couldn't because you'd have to have his private key. Well, that's, what, that's what I said. Oh, so, oh, okay. Yeah, if I got his private key, would I be able to? I would be able to, yeah. So, keeping your private key private is, you know, difficult. <laughs> if you mess up on that, someone can read your shit, so, you know. Um, <laughs> Mathematical weaknesses, too. Encryption is all based on, based on really advanced mathematics. But sometimes those mathematical algorithms have flaws in them. There have been lots of previous um, encryption algorithms that have been used in the past, but have eventually been broken based on the advances in computer technology. They're able to like speed up mathematical processing really quickly and able to break encryption. So maybe one day that could happen for encryption algorithms used today. Maybe it's already happened, and the NSA has done it and just hasn't told us. I don't know, mm -hmm. but it's possible. Yeah, and this might not be a related question, but are people encrypting their, like, I am really basic. So are people encrypting their emails? Like, if I'm an activist and I'm trying mm -hmm. to send you something, you know, about tactics or whatnot, mm -hmm. is that how people are trying to send sec data securely? Yeah, that is that is one way. And uh, and what I mentioned before about PGP, yeah. that's, that's the way that email is encrypted. Um, and, and you would have to generate public and private keys in order to do that, to, um, to, to do email encryption. Um, it's, it's, a bit of, uh, it's a bit of a process in order to set that up, but once you do it, it's, it's really easy to send encrypted messages and receive encrypted messages. Um, but, and there's some guys that I included in that resource that will show you step by step how to go through that and in order to be able to send encrypted emails. But that's definitely one way that people are doing it. Even if emails are encrypted, are they still, if your, say, email account or those messages were, I don't know, subpoenaed by, under the Patriot Act, mm -hmm. or from what I understand, they can access almost anything with that, would they be able to force you to de-encrypt them or something? There is, uh, that's actually sort of a legal gray area right now, whether uh, courts can force you to decrypt your data or provide them with the, an encryption key in order to decrypt your data. That has to do with um, like like hard disk encryption too. A lot of people there have been a lot of uh, cases about that recently, and so I'm not sure honestly because there have been precedents both ways that they can force you to and they and that they can't force you to. So it's it's not really certain right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, I'm.
this is probably stupid. I don't know. Um, I'm if I get an email from which I do for, for, from a from a comrade who's using you know who's using their Rise Up mm -hmm. uh, email address and it says at the beginning that they've encrypted it with PGP or something. Mm -hmm. How come I can read it if I haven't used a key to open it? If um, if you see some stuff about PGP in the email, it's it's most likely that they have done PGP signing, which is a different process, and that's all about authenticity making sure the email came from the person oh. who said that they sent it. So that's, that's a different process, but it uses the same technology. So that's probably the... Right, that's probably sorry. Okay, that. yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good question. Um, so in the encryption process, you said there's mathematical formulas, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, is the translation between the mathematical formula into a specific language, text of a language like English? Mm -hmm. Um, well, the mathematical formulas are basically just used to turn any message mm -hmm. um, that you want to send um, in any language, any data files you want to send, into what's called the ciphertext. Um, mm -hmm. So you see in the middle there, basically yeah. turns something that's readable into some gobbledygook that you can't really read. Um, so that's, that's sort of how the mathematics works. It turns something that is plain text into something that is a ciphertext. And so English would be turned into this ciphertext mm -hmm. and then back into English. Yeah, it would be, it would be turned into the same message yeah. um, and in the end when it's decrypted, regardless of what language you write the message in. So. And you can also do that with files too, like pictures or mm -hmm. videos, things like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we talked about compromising the private key or a shared key that's used for encryption. <laughs> um, authenticity. Um, so what if... Um, what if I pretended to be Rick, and I put out a public key that wasn't actually Rick's, but was actually my public key, but said it was Rick's? If someone wanted to send an encrypted message to Rick, they'd find that public key, which was actually mine and not Rick's. They'd encrypt it and send it to Rick, but I'd be able to read it, but Rick wouldn't, because it's using a different public key. It's a false key, so... That would be really easy. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's also a risk of public key encryption. Um, okay, encryption software is too, um, maybe poorly coded, there could be um, a vulnerability in the software used to encrypt data, there could be a backdoor built into it um, that would allow authorities like the FBI or the NSA to, to unencrypt, um, to decrypt messages. So you have to really make sure that the software you use is reliable and trustworthy. And oftentimes that means open source. So, um, and like we talked about before, know who is communicating. Oh, no, sorry. Encryption doesn't obfuscate or hide who is communicating with who. So even though the message is unreadable by anyone monitoring it, they still know you're communicating with that person. And that can have implications, like if they're monitoring like a social network or an activist organization, they can still see who's communicating with who. If someone's communicating a lot, they might be a leader in that organization, so that's still a lot of information that is available even to encrypt your communications. So anonymity. So when we're communicating online, how do people know who we are? Well, our IP address. Does anyone know what an IP address is? Basically, an IP address is um, sort of an identifier from a, of your computer or your home network or something. Um, when you're communicating with the internet, your IP address basically identifies you. And so if you're communicating from home, your ISP, like Verizon or Comcast, will assign you an IP address. And so any communications that you send over the internet are going to be labeled with that IP address. And that is one way to trace back communications over the internet to where it came from to you, or anyone in your house. Your phone number, if you're calling someone, that obviously identifies you. Browser fingerprint. So, uh, web browsers like Internet Explorer or Firefox give out a lot of information when they look up web pages. They give a lot of information to those web servers about your browser. What browser it is, what operating system it is, what version, if you have Java, what what plugins you use, like Flash, what version of Flash, whether cookies are enabled, all this information is sent to the web server. And because there's so much information, and, there's, and that information varies from computer to computer, from browser to browser, 
that's another way that you're sort of sending information that is identifiable to you. So if I go to Facebook, my browser sends all that information. And then if I browse to WikiLeaks, my browser is sending the same information. And so that can be correlated. You can see the same type of browser with these same information is going to these different websites. Cookies too. Has anyone heard of cookies? Mm -hmm. It's basically if you log into Gmail or something, Gmail sends you a little cookie, which basically says that it's stored in your on your computer that says this person is so and so that logged in as you know whatever your username is. And so every time you go to Gmail, you don't have to log in again because it has that cookie that says you are who you are, who you logged in as at least. Email address, like we said before, even if it's encrypted. Your email address is still your email address. If my email address is dance equals at yahoo.com, which it isn't, but that would be a way to say, well, obviously, that's the person communicating. Um, CCTV. Video cameras are everywhere. If you all haven't noticed, they're, if you are being videotaped, if you're in public, probably 80% of the time you're out in public. There is there. Why to you? Oh, yeah. See, see, see what I'm talking about? It's right there. <laughs> And so say I'm trying to be anonymous and do some sneaky stuff on the internet, like send some shit to WikiLeaks at, at the public library so it's not my computer. There's probably a camera in that library videotaping me on that computer at that time. So that's also ways that people have been caught, like whistleblowers um, using free Wi-Fi at a cafe and then paying with their credit card at the, uh, at the register. That credit card was tracked back to them and they looked at the video cameras and saw that person using the computer at that time. And they were... You know, caught. I mean, that kind of thing happens. So, it's tough. Anonymity is really tough. So, Tor. Has anyone heard of Tor before? It's also a publisher. Couple of people. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They do like fantasy, like yeah, sci-fi stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's coincidence, it's I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Tor is a really fantastic uh, piece of software developed developed by a lot of great people. It's called. I mean, they're the Tor Project. You can visit them at torproject.org. Again, they're on that resource list. But Tor is a way to, to browse the internet anonymously, or as you know, anonymous as they can make it. Um, nothing is perfect, like I ever said, so keep that in mind. But this is sort of how Tor works. So say, say we're Alice, and we want to communicate with Jane or Bob, which might be like a website or something like, like WikiLeaks. <coughs> if I want to visit that website anonymously, I could use Tor, and this is how it would work. So Dave here, that computer down at the bottom left, is um, a computer part of the, the Tor network that sort of gives Alice an address of all these different computers in the Tor network. The ones with the pluses are, are Tor nodes. So these are computers that are in the Tor network. And this whole thing here might represent, say, the internet. Okay. There's more than nine computers in there. <laughs> and so Alice gets this list from, from Dave, which is a, a Tor computer, a directory server, to who's in the Tor network, all these different computers. And so then, in order for Alice to communicate with Bob, which is, a say, like a website, um, Alice routes her internet traffic through all these different computers in the Tor network, which are sort of, it's a, chooses a, uh, the Tor software chooses a random route through the different Tor nodes and outputs the, the traffic to the web server. And so the communications in green are encrypted. And so Alice would, would communicate with this computer, um, and that computer would communicate with that, and with that one, and then all the way through. But the computers in the nodes wouldn't know who was connecting to it before. So I'll know this computer knows that it's getting traffic from here. It doesn't, it doesn't know that that traffic originally came from here and then originally from there. So it's a way of sort of um, randomizing your traffic, sort of sending it through some obfuscation. Um, but of course, if your data isn't, with the website, isn't encrypted, like say you use HTTP instead of HTTPS, that data is still unencrypted at the end. And so it could be monitored. Like if I'm sending my login credentials to Facebook through the Tor network and I'm not using HTTPS, well, they can still see who I am. Oh, even if you're logging Facebook, I don't know who you are, but that traffic could be captured by somebody monitoring. Um, and then, when you say monitor, are they yeah. monitoring the, the space between? Or is so, it like the actual 
data that lives on the computer. I can do either well, one. Yeah, either one. Yeah. So is there is there a space between? Mm -hmm. There is. Yeah. I mean, in order. I mean, I don't know if that makes any. I'm, no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, if I want to communicate with a, if I want to communicate from my computer to a website, uh -huh. the traffic from my computer has to go through a lot of different routers or other computers, basically, to get to the Facebook web server. Um, so somebody monitoring your traffic could be sitting in between you and Facebook on one of those routers, listening to all traffic that goes through it. Um, that's one way, and there are actually a lot of um, confirmed uh, NSA data centers in the buildings of like AT&T and Verizon that actually do monitor traffic. And there's a, there's a list of, a map of them actually on my resource list here. They, they could also, um, the FBI could also subpoena um, a website and, and see who logged into that website over a certain period of time, what data they have on that person. So Twitter was subpoenaed um, recently um, about, uh, I think it was like some anonymous hackers basically they wanted to see who was using Twitter under these certain accounts and Twitter gave up that data. So that's another way. A third way could be if they're on your local network. So if I'm at a, a, a cafe using the Wi-Fi, um, if I'm not doing that securely, someone's also sitting in the cafe could be on, using that wireless network, could monitor any traffic that I'm sending to. So there, there's a lot of ways for people to monitor traffic, which is why encryption is super awesome and important. Um, so say Alice, Alice wants to communicate with Jane now instead of Bob. Uh, Jane is another website that Alice wants to go to. Um, the, Tor, uh, the Tor software will choose a different route, say one, two, three, in order to send traffic. So it'll, it'll periodically change the the, the route um, or the Tor nodes that are used to send your data, which is another way to sort of make you a little bit more anonymous. Um, are there any questions about Tor? Uh, it's really fantastic software and they make it super easy to use. You can just download their software and start it and it's super simple. Um, but I definitely encourage you to look into it and, and read up about it. It's really interesting. Um, and again, there are resources. I'm sorry? For sale. Uh, it is free. All the, all the technologies I'm talking about are free, unless I mention otherwise. Um, and there are also guys in the resource list that'll, that talk about Tor and how to use it. Um, so what are some of the strengths of this, of this technology for increasing your anonymity? It hides your IP address. It does hide your IP address. To a, to a certain extent. We'll talk about some of the weaknesses too, I guess. Anything else? Why might you want to use Tor? Because it randomizes the pattern in which you get things, which makes it harder to, to trace. Mm -hmm. why, why might you want to do that? Why would you want to be anonymous? Because all of us who check the schedule for, more than, <laughs> for this conference, <laughs> you know, we if we had gone through Tor... Yeah, it, it wouldn't have, have, would have not logged your IP address. Yeah. If you did not use Tor. Your IP address was locked when you went visited that website. So, I'll leave it up to you whether you think anonymity is important, but I hope I demonstrated with my discussion about the NSA that it is kind of important. At least I would, I would not want them to know everything about me on my communications. So basically hiding the origin and destination is the point of anonymity. So some vulnerabilities. If I use Tor and I log into Facebook, I'm still getting my username, they know who I am. And then if I go and browse WikiLeaks, well, that's sort of stupid because they already know who I am. They saw my traffic is going to Facebook at a certain time and sending these login credentials. So if you're sending information, like sending an email to someone, saying like, hey, do you want to come to my party next week? This is the address. And if you're using Tor, well, you just gave your address out. It doesn't matter how anonymous your traffic is, you know. So just some common sense there. Web browser fingerprint, we talked about that, all the information your web browser sends. Um, Tor has a way to sort of uh, counter that. They use their own built-in browser that you can use when you download their software, so that's one way of getting around that. Any other vulnerabilities with Tor? Yeah? I've heard that the, the folks that want to watch us are becoming nodes in the network. That's, and yeah. Be, by being nodes, then uh, trying to you know, figure out the, the paths mm -hmm. because they were already in the network. 
Yeah, that's a great point. So say I'm the NSA, and I want to monitor everything because that's just what I like to do. <laughs> so, say, so, so basically, to, to be a part of the, the Tor network, to be one of these little green pluses, to be a node in the network, it's basically like a volunteer basis. Like, you install the software on your computer and be like, I want to be a node in the Tor network. Send your traffic through me. And the Tor software will do that. But if I was the NSA, what if I were four out of five of the nodes in the Tor network? What might, be, I, what might I be able to, to learn from that if I were the majority of nodes in the Tor network? Well, you'd at least know who was using anonymity software. Mm -hmm. So if I was this node, I could see who's connecting to the Tor network. I wouldn't be able to see then where it was going, but say I also controlled this one, which is an exit node because it sends it out to the internet. If I controlled this one and I controlled that one, then what would I, what would I know? Exactly, because I can correlate connections to this entry into the Tor network with traffic coming out of that exit node. If if those connections happen at, at the same time and last for the same amount of duration, it's pretty likely that it's that it's that person that's connected to the Tor network. So yeah, a lot of people have been saying that it's possible that the government controls the majority of the exit nodes in Tor. I don't know how true that is. I don't think. Anyone besides the government itself knows how true that is, but that is certainly a possibility, um, and that's called the uh, um, is it the global adversary um, vulnerability in Tor. So, if you control, if you if you monitor most of the internet globally, I mean you can you can correlate where traffic goes to. I don't know if anyone has the capabilities yet. I kind of doubt it, but it's possible. I mean theoretically. Why not have one really like super secure node like like that will <laughs> make it that will be trustworthy enough to not because then there's only one place that whoever wants to attack you. Oh, everybody's yeah. just going there. They get in that yeah. one place and they've got everything. So yeah. just, you know, maybe one of the people that works there happens to be you know working mm -hmm. for somebody else. Yeah. So the great thing about Tor is that there's so many computers in there that you can sort of hide your traffic by going through a, a random assortment of those. When, when you hear about like those things with the government take, becoming Tor nodes, is that like is your advice to people to use Tor less or to become more nodes? Like, do we combat that by good people becoming more nodes and yeah. them out? Or? Yeah, the, the, the more people that are involved in the Tor network, the stronger it becomes. So if you have the bandwidth and a computer that's always on, I'd recommend. I mean, help out. So, and there's some guys on the Tor website that tell you how to become part of the, the Tor network, how to become a, a, a router in that, that network. So, yeah, that's that's one way to increase the, the, uh, the resilience and the, you know, strength of the Tor network. Yeah? Um, does it decrease your um, computer network security to be in the network at all? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? No. About that. I'm not really sure. That's a good question. And there's there's a lot of um, discussions on the Tor <laughs> website um, that talk about the vulnerabilities, and they list more than I talk about here. So okay. you can read up on that. I'm sure there'd be some on there. That's a good question. And does it? You were saying if you have the a right amount of bandwidth, so it takes up, it would take up traffic. Anyway. It would, yeah, yeah, because there would be there would be web traffic, you know, passing through your computer. So yeah, if you have you know a lot of bandwidth available, I wouldn't recommend doing it if you use the computer with a wireless network. Because, I mean, wire is a lot slower than having a wired computer, but you can try it if you want. Um, so know you're connecting to the Tor network. So if I, I used to work for the National Science Foundation um, in this big government building in Arlington, Virginia. And whenever I was browsing the web, I used the Tor network. And then one day my uh, IT supervisor came up to me and he's like, why are you always connecting to the Tor network? Because <laughs> he saw the traffic that was leaving their network. And it, it obviously goes to the Tor network. I mean, it's 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 you can't hide the fact that you're connecting to Tor. Mm -hmm. And so he called me out on it. He he couldn't see where where my signal was browsing, but he knew I was connected to the Tor network. And so he looked and find that out. What did you say? What happened? <laughs> um, I, I just told him I, I wanted to be super secure in checking my email. This is some bullshit excuse, but he didn't pursue it any further. <laughs> yeah. So. 
Um, oh yeah, and only certain protocols work. Web browsing works pretty well with Tor, but other things don't. Like if you're using P2P software, like like uh, BitTorrent or something, that does not work on the Tor network. Oh really? That does not. Yes, because it uses uh, UDP um, as well as TCP, which is you don't really have to live. But it's basically it leaks information um, to the internet about your uh, and you know your location, your IP address, and whatever. So web browsing good. Um, Email can work if you use like Gmail or a web, you know, web browser, a web interface email or something. But not everything works, so don't don't use BitTorrent on the Tor network. DNS leaks too. So uh, depending on how you're using Tor, like if you use their browser bundle, which is the way to go, I think that locks DNS leaks. But basically, um, DNS leaks are if, if I want to go to um, to Yahoo.com. Yahoo.com is, is a name that's used to describe the IP address of the Yahoo web server. Mm -hmm. And so my computer has to figure out what that IP address is. And so it uses DNS, which is domain name system, okay, um, to, uh, to find out what the IP address is. And that traffic is sent uh, differently than my regular web traffic. And sometimes that will not go through the Tor network, if, even if I'm using Tor. So although my web, my web browsing data will go through the Tor network, my DNS request to find out the IP address of the web server I'm connected to might not go through the Tor network. And that could, you know, anyone who to my traffic could see still what websites I'm going to. So, uh, for more details on that, you should check out the Tor website. It talks about all that stuff in more detail. So, it's a great piece of software, but it's not perfect, like everything we're talking about. So, metadata too. If you take pictures with your camera, or with a, I mean, if you take if you take pictures with your cell phone, or with a camera too, they embed certain invisible data into those photographs, like your GPS location. If you're using your cell phone, the date it was taken, what equipment was used to take that picture. So if I'm using Tor to send a picture to someone, but it includes my GPS location in that photo, well, I mean that's data that can be tracked back to me, even if I use Tor. Some other anonymizing technologies are. Um, Tormail.org, which you you have to be using Tor in order to access it, but it, it's a it's a pretty cool service that allows you to use email anonymously. Um, and also Linux Live CDs. Does anyone here use Linux or has familiarity with one a couple few folks? So these are basically operating systems that you don't install on your computer, but you just run on a CD. And so it's it's a fresh install every time you use it. It doesn't have any of your data on it when you boot up. That's a one way to sort of increase your anonymity and security. Tails is an operating system that I recommend. Uh, it's been out for a while. It's been tested by a lot of people. It's a Linux live CD that's basically tailored toward anonymity and privacy. Uh, so that's a good one. I was going to burn some CDs for people for that, but my CD burner is not working, so I'm sorry. But it's listed on my resource sheet again. You can look it up and try it out. Liber Liberté is another one. It's very recent. Um, it's got a lot more capabilities than Tails. But it is recent, it has not been thoroughly peer reviewed, and so I would say check it out, but use it at your own risk. Can these be run on flash drives? Uh, yeah, a lot of them you can run on flash drives too, yeah. Um, yeah, instead of CDs, you don't have to burn CDs all the time. Alright, <laughs> security. <laughs> security is the last uh, category I'm going to talk about. Since security totally trumps privacy and anonymity. If I am totally encrypting all my communications, if I'm using Tor for everything, if someone, if, if someone enters my house while I'm at work and installs a keylogger or some sort of virus on my computer that lets, lets them monitor everything, it doesn't matter how much I encrypt or how anonymous I am on the internet. Because my environment's been compromised, my computer's been compromised, and therefore they can see everything of mine on my computer. So that's, that's sort of a general concept of, about security is securing your environment, making sure your devices are safe, making sure your data stored on your devices is safe, um, and no one has access to it besides you. And passwords are a big part of that. Everyone uses bad passwords. Everyone. It's, and it's so common, and, it's, and that's the source of so many security um, you know, break-ins. Like, Sarah Palin's email was hacked, and you know why? Because she used a really shitty password, and someone was able to guess it. Uh, Muammar Mor Gaddafi, I think, or some high oh my gosh. official Libya had their email account hacked because they used 123456 as their password. Mm -mm. I'm not joking. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's so many people use bad passwords, so really, you gotta work on it. 
And so this is this is how people guess those passwords. They use personal identifiable personally identifiable information, like like say if I had a kid, I would I would use my kid's name as my password. People can collect information about you easily and use that to try passwords. They use short passwords, like one, two, three, four, five, six. They might use a dictionary word like my email address was bananas12. That, that can be easily cracked because, it uses, because the way that, that passwords are, are brute force cracked, they go through a list of dictionary words because most people use dictionary words in their password, and they try all of those. So if you use dictionary words, at least if, you, if it's a short password, it's, it's pretty insecure. And reusing passwords. Raise your hand if you reuse at least one password on multiple sites. Every one of you should raise your hand because I know you do. I used to do it too. How do you remember them all? That's a good question. That's difficult. And there are a lot of algorithms. Some people use like sort of mnemonic devices. Um, but I prefer to use a, ma a password management software mm -hmm. um, like KeePass. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll list them on the next slide too. But there's some password management um, solutions that'll come up with really big, long, random passwords that you can use for websites. But you only have to remember one password in order to access the database, mm -hmm. which is great. Yeah. But there's also vulnerabilities because if if your one password isn't super strong or somebody gets it somehow, then you're your host. I mean, they get all your passwords. So if passwords is a tricky thing. I think in general it's a bad form of security. People, I mean, I you know people used it because it was simple when they, when computers were being developed. But yeah, passwords are tough. So try and use strong passwords if you can. Um, this is a yeah. comic that sort of describes. Uh, one way to come up with a good password. So some people use like weird characters and numbers and all that kind of shit. That can be good. It introduces, it's harder to crack, but it's really hard to remember and usually it's short. But if you use something like on the, on the bottom row there, like four random words strung together, it's super long. Even though they're dictionary words, it's super long and actually, in fact, more difficult to to guess or to brute force. So, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I Sometimes use it. you can put spaces in passwords too. A lot of people don't know that. It doesn't have to just be characters or numbers. Really? It's some passwords. I mean, some websites won't let you do that. But um, yeah. So I was kind of freaked out when I, I logged into Facebook once and I typed an old password and it actually said, "It looks like you're trying to type an old password." That's like, creepy, isn't it? Yeah. It's <laughs> saying in your old password. Yeah. Yeah. If sites will do that so that you don't reuse old passwords. Like, they may save, a, I mean, who knows how many they save, but certain programs will save a couple of old ones, so that if you try to reuse them when they tell you to that reset your of, password. That was really freaking yeah. to me. I don't, it's, it doesn't feel like a courtesy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> um, so, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to go over this real quick. Um, but, yeah, like I said, if there's like a keylogger on your computer, which the FBI has developed their own software keyloggers in order to install on suspects' computers to log everything you type into your computer. If that happens to you, no matter how awesome your password is, it can, it's, it can be compromised. And if you use a password management database, like I talked about before, like KeyPass or LastPass, um, if, if they get the master password, they get, again, that's, that's everything. So lastly, securing your environment. Just update your stuff, seriously. Like, Make sure your operating system is up to date. Because if it's not up to date, there are vulnerabilities in the software and people can exploit that to break into your computer. So Windows update, make sure it's on and you're always updating constantly. All your third party software like Java and Flash, those are often exploited. Adobe Reader. Um, just make sure all your software is up to date and really try to be on top of that because that is a big way that computers are compromised. Uh, make sure you have a good antivirus and firewall on there. Um, that should be on every computer you have, including your mobile phones. If you have an iPhone or Android, there's antivirus software for it out there, and you should you should use that. Um, and finally, file and disk encryption, which is a super awesome technology. I wish I had more time to get into it, but it's super fun. And if your computer is off and it's confiscated by the FBI or something like that, they pro if you if you use a good password again to encrypt your com computer, then they can't get to your files. So it's uh, super awesome. Technology. I recommend TrueCrypt if you use Windows, um, and it's on my resource list. There's some guides of how to encrypt your hard drive, how to encrypt files, all that kind of stuff. And don't let people you don't trust to use your gadgets. Just common sense. Is there a but, Linux uh, recommendation for encrypting? What's that? Linux recommendation? Um, Lux, L-U-K-S, is what I use. Um, it's, it's definitely a lot more work than setting up Windows encryption, but 
it's, it's, it's available. So, yeah. L-U-K-S. L-U-K-S, yeah. I'm pretty sure when a partner of mine had, had, a, had a laptop seized that the fact that it was encrypted kind of, well, the, 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 I think legally speaking, they were, they were, they were sort of forced to deliver up the... Yeah, again, that's one of those, those legal gray areas. Right. Um, there have been some legal precedents where people have been forced to give up their encryption passwords, yeah. and there have been some in which they've been, when the, they, it's been ruled that they did not have to give that up. Yeah, so okay, right. It's, yeah, it's hard and to know that. And it has no jurisdiction. So. Yeah. You want to put them next to your computer. Yeah, yeah, get really strong legs and just ruin your hard drive. Um, some AV vendors have actually been known to cooperate with federal agents like McAfee and Symantec. And so viruses created by authorities have actually been let slide and they won't detect them. There's actually been cases in where that's been found out to be true. So keep that in mind. Yeah, Look for a good antivirus vendor. Um, to do that? I don't know, honestly. I use AVG. I don't, I don't know how awesome they are, but their antivirus product is really good. Okay. It'll detect viruses that don't have signatures known for them really well. It's called heuristics. Yeah. So I use them. I get a quote. Well, and it's important to realize that your antivirus software is a seatbelt. It's not yeah. a given that totally. if a virus isn't known, well, yeah. I mean, that I, there's I mean, a good chance that it can't. It won't be detected. It won't be detected, and mm -hmm. it's not necessarily anybody doing something intentionally, it's you don't know what you don't have. Yes, exactly. So, that's it. I run under the assumption that my communications are monitored because it's easy, cheap, and completely legal for the government to monitor your communications, and so I wouldn't think. It's really not hard. Um, so, I think these are some great technologies to look into, to research yourself, and to use. Nothing's perfect again, but there are ways to sort of mitigate the possibility of your traffic and your communications being monitored. And so why not learn to use it? I think it's just sort of a sort of a mentality to use. It doesn't mean don't trust people. It just means be conscious of what you know the vulnerabilities of your communications are and try and work with that. So thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Definitely check out the resource sheet. It's got all sorts of guides and articles and websites of everything I've talked about. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.